Namaste. So, in the previous episode, Shankaracharya explains elaborately how it is that Brahman is imperceivable, can never be the object of a process of knowledge, whether that is logic or description or names or even direct consciousness. And there is a footnote that explains elaborately how this is so, why it's so, by going back to Brihadaranyakopanishad, where Shankara explains that perception or consciousness is due to duality, and duality is ignorance, the imagined difference between the consciousness in oneself and the consciousness in the so-called object. And that when Brahman is realized by contemplation of the Mahavakya, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, that ignorance disappeared. And therefore the difference between the consciousness of the self and the consciousness of the object also disappears. And there is simply one self. And of course, there's that famous quotation from Brihadaranyaka. How can one know that by which all is known? How can one know the knower? Doesn't make any sense that people try to meditate on Brahman or think about Brahman or argue about Brahman <laughs> or discuss Brahman or perform some kind of logical analysis of Brahman. It's unanalyzable. Why? Because it has no parts. To analyze something, you have to break it into its component parts and analyze their relationship and so on, their functions, etc. But there are no parts of Brahman. Brahman is partless. So this is why we cannot perceive Brahman. As Ramana Maharshi said, you cannot see Brahman. You can only be Brahman. So instead of, you know, contemplating, let's say, a pot or another object and thinking, I am seeing the pot. Instead, in the realized being, one is simply being oneself and being the pot and being in both of them simultaneously. This is the experience of oneness, and this is Brahman realization. There is no more consciousness because there is no more difference. But that doesn't mean that we walk around in a fog, unaware of everything, you know, bumping into doorways and stuff like that. No. In fact, the realized being can operate in the world with much greater efficiency and intelligence than the unrealized being, because he's not assigning arbitrary labels and qualities to the different manifestations of Brahman. It's all just the self. So let's review this last paragraph because it's so crucial. And judging from the comments on yesterday's video, <laughs> most of the people didn't get it. So let's go over it again and then go into the quotes that Shankaracharya uses to support his conclusions. Opponent. If Brahman be not an object of knowledge, it cannot logically be presented by the scriptures, as stated in Brahma Sutra 113, Shastra Yoni Tvat, Vedantin. Not so, for the scriptures aim at the removal of the differences fancied through ignorance. 
Not that the scriptures seek to establish Brahman as an entity referable objectively by the word this. What do they do then? By presenting Brahman as not an object on account of its being the inmost self of the knower, they remove the differences of the known, the knower, and the knowledge that are fancied through ignorance. In support of this are the texts, Brahman is known to him to whom it is unknown, while it is unknown to him to whom it is known. It is unknown to those who know, and known to those who do not know. Kenopanishad 2, 3. And you cannot see that which is the witness of vision. You cannot know that which is the knower of knowledge. Brihadaranyaka 3, 4, 2, and so on. So these statements are extremely paradoxical and apparently logically contradictory. But let's take a look at the context in which they occur. And this will bring a lot more insight to the topic. First of all, the Kano Panishad quote, Teacher, if you think I have known Brahman well enough, then you have known only the very little expression that it has in the human body and the little expression that it has among the gods. Therefore, Brahman is still to be deliberated on by you. Disciple, I think Brahman is known. I do not think I know Brahman well enough. That is, I consider not that I do not know, I know, and I do not know as well. He among us who understands that utterance, not that I do not know, I know, and I do not know as well, knows that Brahman. It is known to him to whom it is unknown. He does not know to whom it is known. It is unknown to those who know well, and known to those who do not know. It, that is, Brahman, is really known when it is known with, that is, as the self of, each state of consciousness, because thereby one gets immortality. Since through one's own self is acquired strength, therefore through knowledge is attained immortality. Well, this is about as deep as it gets. The Marianas Trench of Transcendental Knowledge. <laughs> what is he talking about? He's talking about the difference between word knowledge, book knowledge, scriptural knowledge, logical knowledge, verbal knowledge, which in Sanskrit is called vidya, and intuitive knowledge, direct knowledge. Transcendental knowledge. This is called jnana. As we discussed in the last episode, the unanalyzable mentation that I am not different from this. I am Brahman. Everything is Brahman. So there is no duality. There is no subject and object. There is no cause and effect, no time, no space. Only consciousness, only Brahman. And when one has mastered the four states of consciousness, this is a very important point. That is what leads to immortality. In other words, release, moksha. So, those who go around saying, oh yeah, I know Brahman, is like the student in this passage. The student is overconfident. He has a little verbal knowledge, a little vidya, Brahma vidya, and so he thinks he knows everything. And of course, the teacher shoots him down, you know, <laughs> because no, he doesn't really know. If he really knew Brahman, he would say, well, I know about it, 
but I don't really know it because I am it. And I can't see myself, just like my eye can't see itself, because it is the seer. And similarly, because I am the seer and I am in everything as Brahman, therefore there is no separate object and Brahman cannot be known by any process of knowledge because it never becomes an object. So this is the great secret. This is where most of the people who pretend to know Brahman or pretend to have realized Brahman, this is where they go off. Because the scriptures don't try to present Brahman as a thing, as an object. Rather, they present the way to Brahman. And this applies also to the Buddha's teaching that he didn't try to explain or describe Nibbana, what he called Nirvana or Nirvana. He simply detailed how to realize it, basically by the same process, neti neti, not this, not this, not this. Whatever appears to be an object with a separate existence is not it. So only when all objects are deleted, in sushupti consciousness, the great void, emptiness, nothingness, no self, no anything. <laughs> in that space, Brahman shows up automatically. The mood of the Buddha is very nice because he says, I'm going to tell you all about how to realize this Nibbana. And then you go off and do it and experience it for yourself. Don't listen to me. I could be wrong. Investigate for yourself. Realize it. And then we can talk. But actually, at that point, there's no more need to talk. So let's take a look at the other quote from Brihadaranyakopanishad and go through the context of it. Then Ushasta, the son of Chakra, asked him, Yagna Valkya, said he, explain to me the Brahman that is immediate and direct, the self that is within all. This is your self that is within all. Which is within all, Yagna Valkya? That which breathes through the prana is your self that is within all. That which moves downwards through the apana is yourself that is within all. That which pervades through the vyana is yourself that is within all. That which goes out through the udana is yourself that is within all. This is yourself that is within all. Ushasta, the son of Chakra, said, you have indicated it as one may say that a cow is such and such or a horse is such and such. Explain to me the Brahman that is immediate and direct, the self that is within all. This is your self that is within all. Which is within all, Yagyavalkya? You cannot see that which is the witness of vision. You cannot hear that which is the hearer of hearing. You cannot think that which is the thinker of thought. You cannot know that which is the knower of knowledge. This is yourself that is within all. Everything else but this is perishable. Thereupon Ushasta, the son of Chakra, kept silent. Ooh, another one of these juicy quotes from Yagnavalkya. <laughs> what a great sage. So this Ushasta is inquiring about Brahman, trying to trip up the teacher. Uh, he's a critic. He's a questioner, a doubter. So First of all, Yagyavalkya gives him the Brahma Vidya. 
that Brahman basically is prana. And this is a, a valid way to meditate on Brahman as the five different pranas which pervade the body and do the different functions of the chakras and so forth, the nadis and so on, the nerves. But then he asks, no, I don't want the vidya. I want to know directly what is Brahman. So then Yagyavalkya answers him with this. <laughs> you cannot know the knower by which everything is known. You cannot think the thinker. You cannot hear the hearer. You cannot see the seer. Therefore, Brahman is never an object of perception. That is the context which Shankaracharya uses to support his statements that Brahman is never an object. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.